check some levels and make sure it's everything sticking to the tape and all that. Right. So. You can put it in soft focus. That's what George. Oh well, well, I've got a, it's, it's actually it's a nice wide shot. So mm -hmm. I'm just I'm not going to go in for close ups. I just want this okay. to be a relaxed thing and not trying yeah. to mm -hmm. zoom in and all that. So right. I'm just going to just let it um, kind of be wide and, and roll with that. I think I think that will be the best way to go. Um, and uh, really, just uh, I want you just to think about things that interest you and, and just let it flow. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to influence the path I, it, because it's it's your memories, and whatever comes to mind is great. And so the only thing I'll do is at a certain point I have to change tape. Okay. okay. So well, Sally, why don't you start? Uh, fact, your memories up to 1945, because I don't have to maybe, having been born in late 42. In fact, if you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves on camera, um, name and, and uh, any other information you want to give, we'll have that at the head of the tape. Okay. Okay. Well. I'm uh, Sally Beth Rosser. I was born in 1938 and, of course, lived in Washington, D.C. until... I was three years old, and at three years old, my family decided to buy a home. My dad wanted a new car, but my mother prevailed. So one day we drove out here to Kensington, and I remember being in the back seat of the car down at the left in the car down at the corner of McComas and uh, St. Paul Street, where there was a little place to pull over. And my parents, I had a little, one of those little metal toy cars, and I played with that while they went up and looked at the houses up here on Farragut Avenue. And I don't believe there was anything on the lot where they built at 3407, but my dad liked the look of the lot because it was level. And he told the uh, overseer or foreman that was there, I mean, it was a Mr. Glenn, I believe, and that he would really like that lot. And the uh, man said, do you have anything to put down payment? My father said, I have five dollars. He gave him five dollars to hold that lot for him because he wanted a garden and things, and that had a nice level backyard. So eventually there were trips out here, I'm sure, to see things going up around on this new hill where it had been cut out of woods, I believe. And uh, many, many big old oak trees around. Uh, when uh, we moved here, the first thing I did as a little kid was to, to kind of locate where other children were because it was important to have a playmate. And there were a few few young kids, but only one, Elise Malone, who was uh, just a year older than me, and she lived down on the corner of uh, McComas Avenue and Farragut. And her father, Wallace Malone, was a pharmacist, and I think he was down at the pharmacy in Kensington, near the railroad station, for a while. Uh, she became a playmate, and it was a, a lot of fun that there were many new families coming in and new children. Um, we had a little herd of children that would get together and go around the neighborhood and we were interested in finding frogs. We discovered that in the hot summertime, the window wells on all these houses that had uh, windows down below the ground level for the basements that we could find maybe more than one frog and they were different colors because the ground up here was red clay most of it where we were in our yard and but other ones had slightly different colors and I, we loved it we would sort of case the joint and look at the houses and wonder if anybody was looking and we would sneak up and look in the window wells to to get there. But we didn't really keep them in our row. And um, I don't know, Johnny came, he was born. November 42. 42. And as a little baby, of course, he brought in 
new things going on. We played out in the yard a lot. All the families did. And in the summertime, all the mothers were home. There were, I don't remember any two-car families in our neighborhood. And many of the, the men that were all home, I guess, worked in uh, wartime uh, jobs, like my dad, who drove a bus. And he was considered a crucial, for transportation was sort of a crucial thing. So he got extra gas coupons, things, and uh, he would leave and work long hours and wasn't there. So the women would get together and, and visit and take us children for walks and things around. And the doors were open. There was no air conditioning. And uh, we were a little, a little herd that ran from house to house playing. And when it, when it got... Uh, too hot, we would go to some of the basements that were cool, where we could go in back doors. And it was really neat because where the men had workshops, I can remember us discovering solder, rolls of solder, which we immediately made into hooks to play pirate. <laughs> <laughs> we got in a little trouble for going into Mr. Bozeman's <laughs> workshop and doing that. Uh, we were one of the were the only family in the neighborhood that had a side porch, and that was a gathering place too for children to play. We ran, had our stick horses, and we would park them, sticking them between the banisters on the side porch. And uh, as we ran around playing, at some distance, sometime because nobody worried once we got to be preschool, but having two strong feet, we could we would go up Macomas in different places, but we could hear my mother call me to lunch. She had a, a shrill, loud East Texas voice, and she would stand on the front stoop and scream, Sally, Sally Rosser, come home, or dinner time. And wherever I was, we would, would leap fences, climb fences through backyards as fast as we could come and make it all the kids, you know, went home for lunch Saturday night. Uh, we were sort of excited and impressed when we went in down here at uh, Coffins, who were very straight-laced upright, and went back through his workshop. He had a very fantastic workshop and saw the uh, pinup girl poster above his work pitch. It was one of those Vargas. I think. That made a big impression on little kids who never seen a pinup girl. But uh, how about in the Zawatskis? That, that was uh, at, a, mm. at a certain time. Of I do remember the blackouts too. You should remember. Oh, the, yeah. I don't remember, of course. We had blackout well. curtains in the basement. And there was a, a person that came around and I I was trying to a remember warden. a warden, who it was, if it was Mr. Cunningham back here, if, it was, if Mr. Hiller did that. But they would come and see if there was a, any little speck of light being shown. And I think Mother got caught one time when there was a little something, and she had to go and you know, pull those curtains. They were probably basement curtains. <coughs> As you know, my mother always was very careful to pull the shade down on the two little windows above, up on her door, in case some extremely tall person came by that could see in her, in her door. <laughs> I remember that. Well, Dad had ration cards too. He yeah. was one of the only ones who actually had plentiful gas, because he was in a crucial service uh, transportation, and he used to he used to give some of his ration cards uh, to to some of his gas ration to some of the neighbors. And he also ferried them down to D.C. because, well, he had to go to Wisconsin Avenue. I, I forget. I think he was. Right on the district line where there's uh, down Wisconsin Avenue. Avenue where it becomes Maryland, that, uh, that whole area. Is it there. Western Avenue? Western yeah. Avenue and Wisconsin's where he went. But he would take uh, people from the neighborhood down and back if they, you know. Yeah. To, and, uh, but, um, I think what interests me, what I remember about them, you know, when I could, looking back over the neighborhood was the, um, 
the, the kind of demographic mix. Of course, you wouldn't have seen any black people at all in Kensington. They were all confined to Kengar. They didn't shop locally. They were certainly refused housing out here. Um, but we, I think, the first Jewish family I'd ever, uh, uh, you know, I remember, well, the, the only Jewish family in the area was the Ellsworths, who lived uh, two doors down Glenway on the right. And we had a number of Catholic families. I wonder uh, about Rudy and Hiller. Were they Jewish? I don't know. Um, there were some Catholic families. I guess the rest probably quite uh, Protestant. A few, there were a lot um, of Catholic families, and a lot of my social life when I was a little kid was being asked to go along to the different festivals, and we went. There was one church they went to up on University Boulevard, extended up near Four Corners. There was a big, mm -hmm. and they would have big carnivals, and that was that was really a highlight of the summer to go to some of those carnivals. And uh, went to some over on Saul Road when the kids started going there. And of course, my parents were Baptists and. The worst thing that could ever happen to a Baptist kid was to become involved with a Catholic boy. This went on until yeah, I was, was grown. Typical of what until I was grown. I was it was started. a southern thing because because in the town where she came from, the Catholics weren't in town in Texas, Atlanta, Texas. They had a Catholic settlement out at Red Hill because they were I guess. I yeah, so you had some Southerners, uh, but by no means were they all Southerners. The Coffins who lived. Uh, Two, you know, two doors down on the right, um, Glenway, um, were Shakers, and they were from New England. Uh, they were succeeded by the Ellsworths, who were a Jewish family. I, so we grew up with them in the late See, 30s, I didn't early even 50s. Think about that. I didn't know they were Jewish. And, um, and of that. course, a variety of Protestants, white Protestants, all white. Some of them, uh, I think, uh, they all probably first house ownership, a few vets moving in. Um, probably, uh, I, I mean, this happened on a larger scale, what we're talking about up in Veers Mill, where that kind of Levitan, of, I mean, the Levitan type tiny houses were built uh, up at Veers Mill slash Wheaton, that whole area. There are vast numbers of those houses, and all those very small houses yeah. built for returning vets. But what it did, it threw all kinds of people together that probably hadn't been together. My, our dad was had been a, grew up as a migrant farmer, and he went to the Navy and was discharged in the D.C. area where he met my mom. They were both from Texas who had come up looking for work in the Depression. And um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, this is a pretty affluent area. We'd just gone through a great recession, but coming, this was, you know, when they, this place was opened up, we were just getting out of a Great Depression in the 40s. When my dad was discharged, and they had a rental place down in Washington, D.C., before they bought this place up at 307 Farragut, 1941, um, they, he, he uh, had gotten a job as a bus driver in what was the biggest, the most modern mass transportation system in the U.S., that was Capital Transit. And my mom was working for the U.S. government, so they made, what, about $300 a month between them, something like that, which was a tremendous salary in 1936-37. Well, that was the basis for them having money to buy. As soon as my mom could get my dad for buying a new car every year, um, because like a, a lot of t people come out of poverty, you know, they have those, those status symbols of wealth. She was a compulsive saver. Yeah, she, she was a very much of a saver, dad. and middle it's class. My way. dad didn't go up middle class. But he had these, you know, a very diverse bunch of people, but made uniform by the fact they were first-time house owners. They were most of them living in an area they hadn't grown up in. Um, they were, they had children, you know, there were a lot of children playing together. And, of course, you had to sit outside. You didn't have air conditioning. So everybody was outside all the time, uh, in, in whenever the weather was good. And, um, of course, it wasn't good in the winters because we didn't have climate, you know, climate change, so we had really severe winters. But in the spring, summer, and fall, everybody was outside until late at night, and so they were all thrown together. I think it was pretty, you know, unique sort of post-war phenomenon at the suburbs, especially the early suburbs in the 40s. We were, I mean, that was the first suburbs pretty much. This was, the, this was the, on the, the crest of the first suburban experience in the U.S., I suppose, and. Um, you know, little things that you wouldn't think, the one-car families, you know, uh, coming out of the Depression, 
workshops, everybody, every man had a workshop, they worked on their cars. You would have seen men with their, the hoods up on their cars, you know, working, which you don't, you wouldn't see today, working on them, changing a tire, changing oil, that sort of thing. Uh, gardens in the back, my dad had a, um, that whole back lawn was filled with a garden, almost all of it with a garden. Occasionally, one time he grew cotton just to show us what cotton was yeah, like. I took cotton, cotton to school to, to show explain them. to the kids because they didn't know cotton from anything. <laughs> um, that, and it was, uh, I think that was unique. Um, and I don't think it's, it could probably ever have been duplicated again in that way. Uh, early strip malls, we had the first ones, they weren't much to write, to write home about, so as they say. But the, uh, there was one, probably the first was up uh, uh, on uh, University Boulevard where Kensington Pharmacy still is, if it's still there. That was still there. That was probably the 50s, I think. Because when, when we were real small, I remember we'd go for walks and how hot and the hot and I can remember walking back up in the, it was sort of a hilly there when they cut it down to put that mall there. We got back in there and it seemed like we had walked for miles. There was a couple of mothers and a couple of kids dying of thirst back there and uh, when they cut the, finally cut out an area there for a while People played baseball there until they built the mall, and it had a sort of oh, a yeah. cliff at the back where uh, it had been cut out of that hill. Oh, I remember uh, vividly, but this was the late 50s, early 60s, yeah. when, this it, when Wheaton Plaza, they called it Wheaton Plaza, what do they call it now? I forget, but it was, it was the first net giant plaza ever built. But I, remember, that, I can see that as a vast wasteland of clay. It had black <laughs> And I uh, remember it going up. It was quite a remarkable thing to see yeah. that go up. Uh, and I also, uh, as a footnote to that, that was a brand new, uh, one-of-a-kind shopping mall in 1960. And, that is, and, and John F. Kennedy made a, a speech there when he was running, um, uh, it was not in the presidential campaign, but he was running for the Democratic um, nomination in um, would have been the um, spring of 1960. And my, my wife, Claire, uh, who was in high school, I kind of think was this, it must have been in the, I can't, it, no, it must have been in the fall of 1960. It must have been when he was running. I, I'm sorry, I forget this. It must have been the fall of 60 when he was already the Democratic nominee. But he gave a speech up at Wheaton Plaza and they took off school um, they, no, they can't have been, it must have been in 59, because we graduated in 60, it must have been, um, it must have been the spring of 69, because we graduated, he, no, he, he must have been running for the Democratic nomination. Anyway, he was a relative uh, non-entity at that point, um, a newcomer, probably like Barack Obama, in the early stages of his attempt to gain the presidency. And, and, and similar to Brock in the fact he was a Catholic, and uh, it, this, was like an this was like going to be an apocalyptic event, the same way that many people on the right viewed Barack yeah, Obama as being, thing, thing, it, 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 his presidency being like something inconceivable. Kennedy's was that way. Anyway, they, uh, they took off school and passed themselves off as high school reporters, and they took them up to the Indian Springs Country Club. and, and uh, Kennedy actually sat up there, gravitated toward these two young women after he gave a speech and sat down. And I remember my, and, and so they had lunch with JFK in 1960. And, uh, and my wife remembers him as being the most urbane and well dressed man she'd ever seen because most of the, quote, leading men in politics and in film looked much older as most leading men in the 30s and 40s in films did, but he wasn't, he was a very modern looking man. Anyway, so that was the 60s, and that, that, that took, that, that little journey up to the Indian Spring Country up, took place in Wheaton Plaza, so the earliest little strip malls and so forth, and uh, then this plaza uh, began. Um, you saw it develop here, just like you saw the earliest uh, versions of, if not Levittown, suburban communities here. And the whole post-war experience, such as you were seeing it for white people kind of being thrown together in these suburban communities, when, was a phenomenon. When I went over to a junior high school, at Kensington Junior High School, that year, all of those uh, children of the 
correct age up there at Beersnell Village, were moved over and really expanded the numbers at the uh, junior high school. I remember there were lots and lots of students that came from Beers Mill Village, which we had, I guess we'd seen it go up because when we lived here at first, our family doctor was up there in Rockville. And uh, we would drive up there, you know, to go to, to, go to the doctor for various, to get shots for tick shots or I don't know what it was, poison ivy shots, yeah. which we hated. But So we had watched Beers Mill Village go up and then suddenly here were these hordes of new kids we had yeah. never known. We'd gone to school right. all together, you know, from kindergarten to sixth grade with all of these other friends and went to a school uh, building that was rather small that later would put many different sections up there at Kensington Junior High to make a circle almost complete. But that year it was very small. And uh, I even rode my bike. Okay, I did it a few times. Yeah, there were just two-lane roads. All these, and the major roads were two-lane roads, so you and could there easily ride. No, that wasn't yeah. a problem. And our parents let us do it. But I was also thinking, Sally, as you mentioned that about Beers Mill, because I remember we went up to Beers Mill occasionally to shop. To the shopping center, the, the shopping center there was on the corner of Randolph and Beers Mill Road. Yeah. Um, but on on that, that there was a movie. It theater. was a movie theater. I thought of that because that's where we went to see movies, and I and and I remember seeing the first three D movies there. We saw the creature from the Black Lagoon there, the Not thing, me. the <laughs> thing where James Arness he was the thing. He would later start going, um, and a whole bunch of other ridiculous but but scary kinds of films. Um, uh, up in up in that theater, and then that made me think also of the uh, the um, the importance of all this new media, including the TV. Uh, the Bozemans, who lived on our street, um, had the first TV, so we always um, we gathered there in I I don't know what what date would it have been like fifty three or fifty two. Before that even, because I remember when we got a TV in elementary school. In elementary school, because we got a TV by '53 or '54, because I remember watching John Cameron Swayze give the news, and there was always a map of, of Korea and the 38th parallel. I always remember the 38th parallel, and the Chinese were either crossing it or being shoved back, and that would have been the Korean War. So that was early '50s, but we were the Bozemans was before that, and that was uh, Howdy Doody. Big that deal. Sort of we all watched Howdy Doody. Frontier Theater, where before that was a rerun of all these old westerns from the 50s, where you saw the same guys riding horses. You probably watched on. Space Cadets. We watched Tom Corbett's Space Cadet and Captain Video a little later after that. But that was, all the neighborhood kids went over to that TV, and then we were two or three years later in getting it. But that, the other thing that, that uh, so we grew up on radio, really. Um, on the Green Hornet, Fever McGee and Molly, the FBI, Peace and War, all those great ones, one after the other uh, on weekend nights. And when you were sick, all you did is just stay home and listen to the radio. But it, but I was thinking about the uh, the fact that um, my our parents could even afford a TV, and um, this area must have been an area of uh, they kind of got out of the depression a bit earlier because of the war and the wartime I industries around here. Uh, certainly my dad and mom making 300 a month, they were like very wealthy. I mean, they, when they went back to Texas, my dad's family was not even middle class. And I mean, they were just, my dad was making a salary with, they were making, that they couldn't even conceive of, and up in an urban area. That's, that's what he had done in the Navy. He had set all of his earnings, and he would keep it, maybe five dollars or maybe less for himself and send his whole salary for home month. to East yeah. Texas because they were in such dire straits. So. But the affluence that we this were, better. Sally and I were of a generation that we'll probably never see it again in this country, which, uh, I mean, we don't remember the Depression. All we remember is our parents suddenly getting new cars. Be began in the late 40s and 50s. Dad kept our car, that old 1940 Dodge, as most people did. They kept pre-war cars until about late 40s or 50s. Um, but then they started buying a new car every two or three years. Yeah. 
and um, and so we remember that, and then we remember having a car of our own, a hand-me-down car. Uh, I had an old taxi cab that I drove at the University of Maryland with that I painted Earl Shy paint job for thirty, twenty, thirty dollars, and. Um, but we remember uh, the affluence, you know, the rock and roll, all the, the kind of, the, you know, teenagers as having enough pocket money and having a car and, and being, you know, zapped out on music and stuff, zapped out in the sense of pre and preoccupied with their, their acne and all that. that. That was, but basically not having to have the kind of hardship that other generations have had and never worrying about uh, getting a job. That, uh, that, we, that, that sort of uh, post-war affluence, and especially as it affected young people. But it affected our parents, too. They, I mean, they never forgot the Depression, but they, uh, rising college, incomes, yeah. uh, labor unions, you know, my dad was in a labor union. The uh, Capital Transit, remember, was bought up by old Roy, Roy Chalk, Roy who Chalk. practically ran the thing into the ground. I remember that they were on strike. We went down to Texas. They won the strike without that union. My dad would have. He would have. He, if they had a right to work, these right to work laws. You know, my dad, we would, we have been thrown out of work. So labor unions, um, uh, you know, living in the D.C. area. These were all tremendous factors uh, that that uh, made the experience of growing up here, I think, quite unique. And I, you know, getting an education was very important to our parents, and they worked long hours and to be sure that we had the uh, opportunity to go to school and I was able to get scholarships. First, uh, it doesn't seem like much, but I got one for a couple of years over at Montgomery College. It was Montgomery Junior College. and. Uh, then I, I think I had, I'm trying to think if I had it one year part over at American University when I switched over there. But my dad worked very long hours, my mother did, and Johnny and I both got jobs. We worked too, and our parents were very supportive about any uh, thing they had to do to be sure that that we got our, did our work and got our schooling yeah. because Dad had wanted to go to college and he had a scholarship. It was offered two different ones, playing football, play football. and uh, he was not able to take advantage of them because he didn't have any money, you know. Yeah, he grew up, very, he was extremely he, poor, he was, the family was. And, uh, so, no, the, the, the land-grant colleges, public education uh, played a tremendous role. I don't think, I mean... And I never had to look for a job. It was just... We never had to I look for a job. I did my student teaching. No. My his dad, you know... The principal liked me that yeah. he wanted a job. I, I stayed with him. I moved with Mr. Shoemaker and, and Thomas Powell yeah. Jr. High. We never were worried about took a, jobs. We, did, we didn't graduate uh, with debt. Oh, now my, you know, my dad's experience was probably may have been a bit extreme in terms of his, how he started out in poverty. But I suspect there are many men in the neighborhood who had come from rather impoverished circumstances. He he rebelled from his father at 15 and went and got his high school education because he was part of a migrant. This is in East Texas. He, you know, they lived as migrant farmers. These children were picked cotton. Yeah. And took so they moved around. So he rebelled against his father and went in and became a, a boarder uh, for Mrs. Powell, took care of, did some odd jobs for her and became the school janitor to get his high school degree. He played football, got a scholarship, broke his collarbone and, and gave up his scholarship. The Honorable Manny was, couldn't find work. Uh, in, he graduated from, from high school in 1928, I think. The Depression came in 29. He went to the uh, bar borrowed fifty dollars to get his teeth fixed and was accepted to the Navy, it was in Honolulu with, with the, uh, you know, with Pacific Fleet for s six years. Discharged at DC as a x-ray technician in 1935. So, um, you know, that the, the fact that what he, um, uh, so he was, deter you know, always valued education he was uh, fortunate to be able to go into the Navy. That gave him, showed him what a professional life was like. He was also fortunate to be white because black people couldn't have, were in the Navy, but they were all stewards. Um, 
and he he took care his last assignment over at the Naval uh, Hospital, and, and, and he was I think then in D.C. and up Bethesda mm -hmm. was to, I mean he was an X-ray technician. He X-rayed Franklin Roosevelt and and, the, and his wife and so forth. But was to take care of an old, of an old army commander, uh, sorry naval commander who died and whose last dying uh, wish to his wife was to look after my father. And so this lady, who was well connected in DC, gave my father all these letters and uh, of, of recommendation. And essentially, said, "I can get your job as a fireman, a policeman, or a bus driver." And nobody could get jobs in. And she had connections because they owned one of the Washington papers, like Washington, Washington Star, Star, or something like that. Star or something. So anyway, says, he can... marched down to Capitol Transit, which was hiring, and there was a line of like 300 men. And, uh, and the guy said, go back to the line. He said, back into the line. He said, I have these letters. He looked at the letters. He was hired that day. So um, even, even uh, there, there are still stories of uh, cir had to do with chance and circumstance that, uh, that uh, among all the people here, there, again, uh, being white helped, being in the service probably helped. Uh, there were some class differences in this neighborhood. People were better educated than others, but uh, you know, a lot of people were their first time homeowners coming out of rural, some of them out of rural backgrounds, and uh, all of them out of the Depression. And, uh, and, and after the war, a uh, period of rising affluence and uh, stability that we grew up in. A, this is a very stable neighborhood. And uh, you know, Our crime free and everything. It, it's a very no, it's a unique period in American history, and you know, and I think maybe even more unique in this area for being around D.C. This is a unique area to grow up in. The biggest sh shock for me, uh, the, one of the big things, when I went to high school over at Bethesda Chevy Chase, which had a whole group of students who were from very, very wealthy families. They yeah, belonged to the a... Congressional Country Club and different yeah. places. And they'd gone to Leland High and it was a, they called the Kensington, I didn't realize that we were the bridge setters, referring to the railroad bridge. And uh, which reminds me that, yeah. that that was a big thing, that railroad that interested us when we were kids because when I was in elementary school, there was no school bus. We walked to school with the older kids and I was so proud to have my book bag and, and hold your, had, some of them had books and they held them like this. Mm -hmm. And we would imitate the older kids. Well, when we would get there, there was a morning train that came from Garrett Park, which you could hear the certain blow that they have for different stations. A steam engine. And yeah. we would hear the steam engine up there coming from Garrett Park. They picked up passengers, I think, up there. And because uh, Sally Buck's father rode the train all the time. And uh, we would stand on the bridge and you could watch it coming down there with that plume of black smoke that covered all the sides of the bank embankments and everything. And it would stop as it went under the bridge at Kangar. There was an old wooden mm -hmm. bridge there. Still there. And then it would boil up and we would watch it until it got so close we knew we could just barely make it to the mm -hmm. to the end and we would close our eyes and run like crazy to get off the bridge while it went under and you could hear it go under the bridge and then come up with great force on the other side of the black smoke. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, steam and, engines were incredible. And it was, I just loved that. And I, Also, when they stopped in Kensington Station and the steam settled down, it kept coming out of the sides of, yeah. near the wheels. It's, you know, it's quite impressive. We could hear all this from That went from into the 50s, here. too. Now, we had steam engines well into the 50s, too. They didn't just stop. And, uh, the, I remember the electric ones came in. But. The sound of them, uh, because they stopped and moved cars there, and you'd hear the, the uh, cars being put on the siding and banging because they unloaded lumber and stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there was always that. lumber right near the you know, stuff stacked up there, lumber and goods all along there by Mizo, yeah. where the parking lot, the new parking lot is, across from Mizo Lumber. So, oh, it was t and you stacked could hear up them with all kinds of goods. Steam and when they would sit there and the, the sounds of, of that, you could hear those, you know, when our windows were open, 
everything. And yeah. The trees were not as tall. A lot of the well, you were upstairs too, and yeah. yeah. so you could always when I was hear. A little everything. older, I was upstairs, but that was hearing those trains was a big part of it. Still, they were you dirty. can still hear them today. Very dirty. <laughs> Except that you could hear the steam part of it, the engine part of it, it's kind of impressive. But um, no, it was. Um, and I, I knew we knew the station master. Um, we always crossed, or not always, but we usually crossed where there was an actual bunch of boards there, and you could take yeah. your bikes across the track. Yeah. On our way to the playground, mm -hmm. down at the on the cabin, cabin. Yeah, we had we had a range of uh, uh, freedom. The kids don't know that it is something else. With, with our bikes, it went up, uh, sort of all the way up to Beers Mill Road. It went down Kensington Parkway to the the, the, the that uh, cab. I don't know what that park is called, but it was there. The cabin, there. and that was owned by Esther Mizell, who was one of the Mizells that oh, it was? owned uh, hmm. the lumber company. And, and it became a park, a county park. It was she owned that, yeah. And later, I think it must have been donated oh, okay. or something. It had a clay tennis court there. Yeah, that, we all gravitated, but that was one end as well. And then, and of course, even when one, we were then, uh, they told us that that to stay out of that creek because it was polluted. So I don't know if what was being dumped in it then. You never know. Who knows? Oh, but one uh, little cafe, one little footnote to this is: you go down Kensington Parkway, past the old houses, and start to approach the park. When you're right, right before you get to the park, one block away, there's a house that's on a little island, and it's a kind of '50s house with glass and brick. I guess it's still there. Remember when that thing went up? We were so yeah. amazed because it was the first modern. My house. house. This house had a kind of a cantilever roof. Or so. It was a little bit of a Frank Lloyd Wright influence. We thought this is really interesting. Really modern. Yeah, but we, there weren't too many houses. And like up in that. there, we we discovered the little noise library. Oh yeah, that was uh, a we. And I loved it. It was. It's still there, and it it looks much the same as it did when we were. No, no it's hard. To, I mean, it's well known that before uh, TV. Um, the visual, you know, what we kids had was was minimal, but the the we actually, but the impact on living in that kind of visual environment, limited visual we environment, as a, a kid was was tremendous because the first of all the newspapers had pictures, but they were all blurry black and white things, so you could forget about the newspapers. So you were left with what you could get out of the library. Um, before TV, of course, there were no pictures for radio. And so the library was loomed to port, and also we had book um, uh, uh, newsstands. And you would go on a newsstand, you'd see all these periodicals. Beyond that is what magazines your parents subscribed to. And for us it was Look Magazine, Life Magazine, uh, and uh, Saturday Evening Post. Yeah, my, uh, Reader's Digest didn't have pictures. But those mag the actual, I mean, something like Life Magazine, was a, that was a tremendous event when, you, when it came into the house. And that, that was the case really well into the 50s, uh, even for something like the JFK assassination. The life, the life magazines that you can still buy were actually important to us at the time, as much, almost as much as the TV coverage. Mm -hmm. But the visual, uh, uh, the visual uh, uh, materials that we were exposed to were really minimal, so we were left really... Uh, and the TV, uh, available TV for kids was... In the, it started in the evening. It started at 5.30 or 6, over by 7. It wasn't until the, the late 50s that you started to get a lot of evening programming. And then it was Ed Sullivan. So you were watching things with your parents mm -hmm. that, were inter, that were entertaining, Milton Berle shows. Lawrence but they Lawrence. weren't kid shows. They didn't have many kid shows. So we were left to our devices to play outside all the time and to take our bikes and just be gone and, you know, see you later. And that was, you know, that was kind of a unique experience, too, for the suburbs. I mean, in the sense that it started diminishing rapidly in the 60s for kids. One of the things that I really remember in this neighborhood when I was small was that even the older kids, all the kids got together in the summertime, and there were a long period of time when they played hide-and-seek. And we'd play until it got too dark to see. Capture and fireflies. Home base to do that. <laughs> was one of those pine trees that was 
not in our lawn, but just across the next driveway, it where it had been cut driveway was two cement things going back. There were those two pine trees, and they sort of stuck up tall. And I think that was home base. That was always, you know, where the person counted. Yeah. And and there would be a, a bunch of kids, the Masons, the Zawatskis, Dick Bloss. They were all older, and they some were in scouting or something. And they were boys that played ball out in the street. But all the little kids played too. And uh, we would all be running and hiding all over the place and sneaking back. And, Behind uh, everybody's hedges, so you just were all you know, around I people's had, houses all the time. I remember what fun that was. Yeah, well, it and, was very uh, fun. We had a, a walk, a solid walk out front, and we'd play well, hopscotch and stuff. No, it's where you try to leap across the walkway and the guy on the walk would try to catch you. We played all those uh, old games. We played Monopoly on our and, porch. Uh, the kids came over and played cards. Everybody played cards, old maid stuff. And the, yeah. and the parents played cards once or twice a week in yeah. basements. They, they, collected card, cards. they all had card games. Canasta, I don't know, yeah. with poker probably. I, I don't remember what they played. Played but what they played? Not bridge. bridge. This is not a bridge. Community, play community. They probably were playing something in gambling. <laughs> probably. The Masons and the Bloss. And they would have, you know, they would eat together. Uh, the house across the street or the Dutch couple lives, they, that was a, the basement was a big gathering place for all the young couple uh, parents. They liked to dance. And they liked to dance, yeah. And Daddy worked late nights and he really wasn't a dancer. Yeah, he, so he never mother, danced. So mother was usually taking, at home taking care of the kids with the windows open, listening to the dance music next door at Blossus, because they had that patio, uh, that paved, it was just a solid concrete yeah. for the building. The whole thing about the windows open, that, that was a phenomenon yeah. well up until, I mean, who knows when. I don't know, my, my mom and dad never went into, I don't, I don't know when these houses, if they ever got centrally air conditioned. Some of them did, central air. But probably, I, I would suspect even up into the well into the seventies, a lot of them did, had one or two rooms that were air conditioned, or probably a living room. And yeah. Everything else was uh, they closed doors, and other stuff was left open. But having your window open, that was a big, you know, that was just the way it was. You know, it was interesting. But of course, every they play. So we played hours until nine thirty or whatever every summer and collected fireflies. There used to be zillions of fireflies around here. And all stopped only when the good humor truck would come. I don't know if you remember the white good humor truck. It had a, a couple, had one thing on the side it opened and one in the back. I forget, they called out different stuff. Webby. But that or everything stopped. Or to get money or trying to run and stop it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah if, you were, if you were playing hide and seek and were heard, heard him late and he had gone, they didn't stick around too long. But you had to make a big choice with your five cents. Did you want to get a the good humors were the yeah, ice cream with they had tech, chocolate yeah. on the outside, but they went fast. If you got a popsicle, it lasted longer. <laughs> Those are the kind of decisions kids had to make. Our our parents could have been working in the fields or whatever at, at our age, but we we had a good. But we got we got allowances and we had jobs to do. I had to watch. No, we all kids. worked. And my no, father made had, a little two-step. Thing to sit in front of the uh, we had chores the counter and, jobs and sink and there, and Johnny, you probably stood on it too. So we we after supper or something when we had supper sometimes. I would help wash the dishes, and I I had to stand on those steps. To yeah, we all did there. chores. And when I got older, I still I did, and I could remember in junior high, I would go. Do a little bit, come back, try it. We just got to be watch TV. Yeah. Have to leave and go wash dishes again. It would take all the afternoon and all the evening. Well, my, my mother turned me into this fantastic house cleaner because she uh, she used to pay me fifteen cents, ten cents for, for specific jobs, cleaning a closet, cleaning a floor, and she was very particular about how everything. Had, so she'd point out all these little details, which of course. Uh, once or pulling it out, well, if you're house cleaning, once you once you get accustomed to cleaning a molding or whatever, you never you forget bathroom. I cleaned all of her bathrooms. She was happy to do that. I probably underpaid. She paid too. you, paid David and Johnny to 
pick gray hairs when the gray hairs started. Yeah, that's true. Until there were too many. Yeah. And then it was like three gray hairs for a penny or four yeah. gray hairs. Yeah, I know. We used to shave all the saving pennies. Really? They used to look at, uh, and looking at all of our change, I remember that, because if you looked at your change, you'd find a 1905 coin every now and then, or yeah. Indian head penny. And they saved all that. Do you remember how we, we, we inherited all these coins that were not worth, you know, but if a coin, if a penny was worth five cents, they'd save it. They had all the coin value books and everything. To, well, the V nickels and all the V nickels, the little the whatever they pennies. were, aluminum pennies. They had these. Yeah. They, those were. The war. But they were keen on get the buffalo. The buffalo. There will be a time when buffalo nickels don't exist. Save them, and so we would save buffalo nickels and. But you had a lot of early 20th century coinage coming, uh, circulating, yeah. and uh, they, that, that was a way you, that was like long term, like your 401k was a, a coin collection. I don't know <laughs> if you remember, uh, I used to get a quarter, that was my weekly allowance, and one time I loved, I had tasted sweetened condensed milk, because mother made ice, she made ice cream, she made something yeah. that she froze with that. So, I, and I thought you went, might have gone too, maybe you had a quarter. We went down to the Safeway, where the Emporium, the Antique Emporium is down there in Old Kansas. That was where the Safeway store was. Bought our can. Got sweet and then smoke. And uh, doled it out. Doled it out, ate it home. We got sick one hour, I Put it in the refrigerator. <laughs> Almost argued over whose was which because somebody had been into yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my mother loved ice cream, and uh, my father would buy her a little pint or half pint, bring it home, and she would she wouldn't let us eat that. But we never knew what I we, we didn't know what ice cream was. She made ice cream, and then when it snowed, she would go out and get fresh snow and mix it with sugar and, and vanilla. With condensed milk. And sugar, condensed milk. And we ate, that was actually up. pretty good. And that you had to eat it fast. You had to eat it fast, but she she adored ice the cream. The snow was clean then, you know. In fact, she used to have a uh, I, when when the science fair fray after Sputnik or before Sputnik. This had to be before Sputnik. Um, we all did science fair projects. Well, maybe it was post Sputnik. I forget. Sputnik was fifty nine or something like that. But I I did this project that was totally. Uh, Fallacious, but we all had to come up with stuff, and I got some white rats for it down at, in, over at NIH. They were lab rats, of course, very friendly. And one of them died in the experiment, this awful experiment I conducted. And one I, I was uh, lived, and that was became Robespierre. That's Robespierre. Yeah. You know, so we had a succession of pet rats. As a, we had many, many pets, bizarre pets you know, in our household, but exotic, I should say. The best say. were the rats. But my mother loved this rat and would sit in a lawn chair, you know those old webbed lawn chairs, in our living room and watch TV. And the rat would come up and lie on its back and my mother would feed ice cream to it. And it would yeah. stroke its stomach. They, they my mother very, always had, she always loved fresh. ice cream and of course the rat got real obese on this ice cream. But those, by then everybody got real ice cream. The affluence had spread. You, you could chart the affluence of our family by the availability of ice cream too. Beyond my mom. And Pepsi Colas. And we did yeah. not get to drink Pepsi Colas or drink iced tea. And when we go back home to her home in Texas, I can remember we ate, went to eat catfish or something down on Caddo Lake. And we were little, and they started to hand out drinks. And mother wouldn't let us have iced tea. It said that they don't drink iced tea. They don't drink iced tea. Yeah. This poor little mother said, "You know, it has, yeah, it's not good for the children or something." And she had, she was from Texas, but uh, we did not have iced tea. Or when Daddy brought home the ice cream and things, we knew not to ask for the Pepsi Cola or the ice cream. That was hers. She took a an ice cube tray, tray and made up her mixture and would shave it down and put it back and, freeze you know, it. freeze yeah, for it. For us. And it was pretty good. It yeah, was pretty a, well, if you didn't know regular ice cream once, once you... But I think uh, expanding on this idea, they, 
even the, yeah, the affluence could be uh, detected by the amount of ice cream in the house and um, things like that for the kids. But they, but at the same time, it was well probably into the early '60s when they stopped depend, if, dep depending on canned stuff that they made in the summer. I mean, a, a preservative. Oh, yeah. the, the mason jar is full of the shelves in the basement. Yeah, filled with stuff. They, you know, there was a whole period of time at the end of the summer when Mom was, uh, you know, bo tomatoes. boiling all this yeah, stuff, jams. Uh, what do they have? A lot of tomatoes. Lots and lots of tomatoes. Lots and lots of tomatoes. So that's what we ate in the winter for fresh vegetables. Now I can remember also down in Old Kensington where the antique store is, you know, there's a little cafe in one of those places and there's a parking lot behind it. Right on the other side of the parking lot was Safeway. That was the first Safeway. And you walked in, it was like a, a warehouse. It was almost like a warehouse with just open things with all this produce and stuff. So you could buy fresh produce there, but it was expensive. And they grew there were two own. stores when I was little. The DGS was the Jewish. Yeah, by DGS, they were thing. side by side, and the and Safeway. between was the parking lot. And then the Safeway. And the Safeway. And they're basically small stores, but yeah. that's where they stopped. You know. Yeah. You want to take that? Yeah. You want to change the sure. We all in the neighborhood went to the movies to the Avalon in a Chevy Chase Circle. That's true. That would be before Bears Mill. We used to go down there. Right. And, and sometimes to the Uptown. And if you got off, if you got off, and were let off there at the bus station, you could take a bus and probably go out Old Georgetown Road. You could go out somewhere, go to Bethesda, go out Old yeah. Georgetown Road, and it would end up at Montrose right. at the Triangle. There right. Was a, that was where the bus turned around. So I used to be picked up by Daddy, and then he would drop me off again. Coming back. But uh, but when he had the run that came straight out Connecticut Avenue through Kensington to Wheaton, yeah, you would walk. Oh, I remember that. You would go down here and walk out St. St. Paul, t just right up to the University highway yeah. to the bus stop with that with yeah. his bag lunch, and, and he get in the there. Bag lunch. Yeah, the I, I remember Dad taking me on the bus. And Johnny would sit behind. You could sit behind him, and maybe David did it. Yeah. But uh, ring the bus. There's nobody they on the bus. They had a ticket counter, time. and I don't think it really. I don't know if it even worked there, but it was the thing that made a ringing bell sound that yeah. you could reach up. That said, you wanted to stop. It was a For request, that. a stop request thing. A little pull. Thing. Yeah, that was that was something you pulled. But this was a big round thing. That, oh, up front that you that rang. That made a sound like a cash register going. But it, and it, it wasn't in use. No, much. I remember that the old buses. No, the, the, the daddy would ring that, and he, yeah. he'd go up to Montrose, up not Montrose, up uh, where the get, uh, radio station is, or something up there. Up right along the main road, across Bears Mill Road, and up there on the left where there was a radio station. There, it's a place the bus could pull over under the trees. Daddy would eat his lunch, and then. He would turn around and drop Johnny off on the way back. He had to keep to a regular schedule, a time schedule. Yeah, so he, if he I had, mean, if he, he was a little early. That was his off. layover for lunch. Yeah, layover. He had 10, 15 okay. minutes or something. Yeah, yeah. it was. Um, it was a. It's a kind of unique time. And right where you know, the. With all these the different things, I mean, you you let your kid walk up and wait for a bus. You didn't. We had tremendous freedom walking up and. And we knew uh, we knew a lot of the people right right down there where Daddy called it the Crystal Palace, but that tall uh, uh -huh. apartment building at the end of St. Paul across the way. Mrs. Across Cook, University Boulevard. Mrs. Cook used to live over there. She raised, I think. They called were it five, the Birdhouse. <laughs> yeah, the she raised these uh, standard bred gated horses, and one of them was featured in the Sunday paper one time. We all thought it was like a movie star horse. It did the, you know, the high stepping gates, and she used to ride up and down the road on the side of the road, uh, up as far as the firehouse, maybe, and turn around and ride back and forth. There was some room there, and my friend Donald Lindsay, who lived in the little house where Mrs. Starr, right across there, we would go over there and volunteer to do anything just to be around the horses. Mm. And uh, parents never knew. It's, it's like 
when my friend Sally Buck that lived in Garrett Park, we would, we had someone up there that we knew that loaned us horses. We would ride almost a silver spring. We'd go, <laughs> we'd run, ride straight out where, up to where Northwood High School is and turn back in there and go to horse shows and uh, sometimes back through the woods to get over in Bethesda and cross uh, Rockville Pike. There was a huge culvert that went underneath could get off and lead the horses through that culvert. They're all apartment buildings now. When we rode through woods and rode, sometimes we rode bareback, everything, and my, but my mother, she knew we went horseback riding. Never knew we got out and rode up the sides of Rockville Pike <laughs> in the early 50s. Uh, or the times, you know, if you slid off, or the time we got a horse stuck in the it had thawed in Rock Creek Park, and we went across at the wrong place, and the horse flopped down on its side. I stepped on its neck and got to the bank, and we pulled it yeah. out. I mean, she never knew any, we never told her anything. No, there was an element of uh, we risk just, and danger that parents wouldn't accept today at all, and, uh, and would be condemned for. There seems to be a <laughs> lot they allowed of, their kids to have. A lot of meanness, you know, things lurking in the woods, and things you're afraid are going to happen. But I. If they happened, they didn't happen as frequently, and they certainly did not have Fox News, Fox News, to blare it over and over immediately. You know, circle the globe. Yeah, probably there's all sort of danger lurking around that people weren't even aware of. I, I can't. I don't even know. I mean, even when we went to the creek, you, and David, would go down and build. Was oh, David we, yeah. Build no, we were just totally on our own out Come here in this covered woods. Covered in mud. You just met, met all your friends down there. You built. I, and and uh, we had unlimited uh, supplies of fireworks. I don't know if they still are, but cherry bombs, those little red torpedoes. We had, of course, yeah, masked arsenals during the regular 4th of July that we didn't expend. And I remember having, uh, uh, we, you know, I, I was a great organizer. I, work, I figured out that if you put a big pipe in the ground and uh, then threw a cherry bomb down there and put gravel, you could have an artillery piece. So we would bombard, we had artillery going. Yeah, I, I, I remember that. rigging these, they called them blockbusters. They were, they were sort of cylindrical things that had slow fuses. And we put those on arrows and shoot them. I remember landing, blowing off part of a roof, somebody's roof. I don't think we ever got caught, but we would have all these great battles uh, with using them as grenades and artillery pieces and stuff, and all that was going on. Uh, I'm sorry, Mom's not just here. Just right to hear down this. here. I I burned down the woods. Remember, I burned down the. Some, the woods Alan Croft and I lit uh, fire down here. Uh, that whole orchard at the it, it had a lot of gra uh, oh, high man. grass around it with paths through it, and so we were playing. We loved to play with matches, and we burned. Good part of that down. I that heard that heard was that. recognized. <laughs> we got into trouble for that. But I don't remember the police getting in trouble, but I don't remember the police coming, but I remember the fire engines coming to put that out. Well, the Kessie and the Volunteer Fire Department. It was... Um, You've come a longer way than I thought, so. Yeah, I was... Uh, well, I was, a, I was a neighborhood juvenile delinquent because I fell in love with Elvis Presley and got a motorcycle jacket and went around with people he called was. Hoods, that, um, and that uh, there was a place called Shirley's, which still exists. If you walk past the, the girls bank... girls would walk up the street. Do you know where that place is? That, if you walk, do you know where Shirley's is? Was? If you walk past the Kensington Bank? Yeah. Well, that was a hangout. Uh, the older guys who were, I don't know, these were guys like graduated from high school. They were, uh, they were on, they were, they were motorcycle guys who were hanging out there on, on VSAs, Norton's, and Harleys, and um, not, you didn't see too many Triumphs. Early BSAs and Nortons were just beginning to be imported from Britain. That would have been in the 50s, um, second part of the 50s, but mainly around the middle of the 50s. But that was if they had a jukebox in there and old Sebring and stuff. So I went through the whole juvenile delinquent phase. I, I was, uh, I was uh, totally out, sort of uh, considered to be on he the was... wrong track. <laughs> That was jun through junior high. Yeah, that was and then you high. made the then I became turn around. A, then I made a turn around, became a little religious fanatic. I don't, I don't know if my parents preferred more or less, but you saw these waves of 
of uh, the teenage stuff go through this neighborhood. Most of them didn't become juvenile delinquents. And, you know, whose That's great smart. hero was Marlon Brando and the wild one, but uh, yeah. James Dean. But, but you saw it all swip. I think, you know, if, if I look at all this, I think that um, I went to Montgomery, uh, it was called Junior College in the University of Maryland and ended up teaching at Boston College for 40 years. But sometime around half, halfway through my experience there, there was, you know, like 20 years into it, um, Boston College changed. There's no way that anyone coming from Montgomery College now could teach at Boston College. Maybe not even from the University of Maryland. The, at these elite private schools, they're all Yale, Harvard educated. So you also, you saw a certain upward mobility. Considering well, in fact, my father was a migrant farmer and was lucky to become a bus driver. Well, you, had, you don't have that, you don't see that upward mobility in this country anymore. It's probably gone. You had some professors, a professor at Maryland who I think really took to you and... Yeah, he suggested I go to grad school. And, uh, but, um, but who was it? How did you, you got a scholarship? It was it to the Gennadius Library in Greece? Yeah, I went on. It was and, a, yeah, I a got competition scholarships and between fellowships. the United States and Canada Let's all see. over, and he wanted... Yeah, uh, but that kind of book for mobility... And so he had some things that helped you probably... I had no debt. I mean, our... To get our, in our, Boston you know, Two or three, we yeah. paid, we commuted to school and paid $400 or less tuition every year. Do you know what it was? You went to, the, to American University. American, we thought, was very high. It was $400 a, a the year. University semester. of Maryland was much less than that per year. But Montgomery College was like $50 was a like $50 semester. That was like $50 a semester. So those days are probably over. Yeah. Uh, we were very, um, I think, fortunate, if I could say, generation. And I got post war generation. On the way pre to pre boomers and boomers were. <laughs> had everything for going for them. And our parents did too. They had unions, social security, all that. Nobody questioned that. And the, uh, you know, the, the, there was much more than trickle down wealth in this country then for people like my parents. They got a share of what they worked for. And it really made a huge difference from, you know, all those, all these parents' generation, they were all affected by the depression. Not too many people came with a lot of inherited wealth into this neighborhood. Although they, some of them did come as professional people, but most of them were not really professional people. The Zawatskis. The Zawatskis were professional. Uh, Malone was a, a pharmacist. The, pharmacist. the Coffin was worked for cat, uh, something Cadillac. He was a capital Cadillac. Cadillac. He was like oh, he was a mechanic. Mechanic. Uh, Bloss there. National. Worked on the presidential cars. I think some of the things, like, I believe, things like that that would come there. He. But again, you know, he was a mechanic, but he worked for the U.S. government. You know, so he had National Cash Register, Mr. Bloss, nice job. Ellsworths were the interesting. Yeah, they were. They were such beautiful musicians. Yeah, they were. And they world class would, musicians. They were world class. Violinists. She traveled with Isaac Stern. She graduated with him from college, Nancy Ellsworth, and she was not Jewish. No, that uh, was his second wife. And, um, and, and and he was first violin and thus concert master was, of the National Gallery Orchestra. She was, and she was second she violin. She was concert. Well, no, he, he was. might have been there, but she would went and some of the others. She was first. She was really after he died. And she, she played, became, played at the Kennedy Center for years after he died. But, but no, they, they joined at Cedar Lane. They joined the church down there. The, what is that? The the one that. Unitarian? Unitarian Church, yeah. that's where he was yeah. uh, buried from, and had all these people that he had played, uh, quartets and people from the National Symphony Orchestra came out and played at his funeral, it was fantastic. But they would play and they would practice. Quartets. And they had quartets and had the windows String quartets. open, and it was just wonderful. You could just walk in their house almost every evening and hear a ch they have cello and and, violins uh, and violas. And I babysat for their kids. It was kids, amazing. You know, and they would, uh, the, t the two twins, which who were still in the area, and one is up in Frederick, and yeah. they're involved in music. Uh, they had their little violins, and they would play, you know, when they got to the little child stage, their parents would go and leave with their 
instruments, and Roger and Bill would get there. Yeah. <laughs> the violins yeah. and say, we're going, we're going now, the, to play. Mr. Ellsworth was a Russian Jew. He, uh, Nancy was his second wife. Uh, Grant, my friend, was a, uh, his offspring from his first wife. The twins were with the second wife. Uh, yes. But Grant had the basement to himself, and Grant was a very influential person in my life because um, uh, he taught me, I, I never read Shakespeare, but he had read Shakespeare, and he had a whole card game with all the, the characters, and we played that, and I learned all the, the, the plays and the characters, and that, that I'd read the plays. He also, uh, the comic books were a big deal when you were growing up, but he had classic comic books. And that was, yeah, <laughs> so, Wuthering Heights, my first introduction to Wuthering Heights was in a classic comic book. He also had Mad comic book. And that was Mad, the Mad comic books were totally subversive. And nobody, I didn't know anybody else had a Mad comic book with Alfred E. Newman's picture on it. And he also, his father had, um, you know, grown up with socialism around and so forth. He wasn't, and so I never heard anything about socialism or communism, but I heard it from Grant or Karl Marx. Um, but that whole different point of view, with cla you know classical music, Shakespeare. He taught me chess. He he, he beat he, me all the time in chess. He was a fantastic chess player. He also played the classical guitar. Granted, mm -hmm. and he used to play for. So yeah. that inter that that was something we did not get in school, even in the high school level. I didn't get classical guitar. I didn't hear classical music in this area. I didn't hear Shakespeare but, talked about. It. But, also, <laughs> but we got it from the Ellsworths. But they the were arts. When I was in uh, junior high, and I won a summer scholarship to go to the, was it the Abbott Art School, which was a, an old art school down in D.C., and William Walters was a wonderful watercolorist, and he was going to be teaching it. And they were offering this scholarship, this first time they had offered it. They sent it out to the school, and my teacher, Mrs. Steiner, got to pick the person. She got me a scholarship there. And because uh, Mark Ellsworth, along with this Colonel Brusilov, started Music and Arts Center, they founded it there in a little house there next to Naval Hospital. And my mother would go there and kind of keep the accounts and do a little work for them sometimes. He, she went and wanted to buy me a little watercolor set, not something they could afford, and he said no, says she's going down there, she needs a nice set of watercolors. And he picked out a metal box, which I still have, picked all the, the right colors, the Windsor Newton colors, and put them in there, picked out real good brushes, a nice uh, flat, and you know, that I would need, and some good watercolor paper pad, and I, I can't, I think that was about it. And that was it uh, when I graduated or, or left junior high, that was ninth grade, gave me that. and. Uh, I've always, I thought about that, I mean, they were just the most generous and wonderful people. And um, she loaned me her father's violin for a long time because Nancy says, well, violin should be played. And so this is just laying there. Yeah, and if you want to play hillbilly music, whatever you want to play, said so just, you know, be careful. And she showed me. I took a few lessons, but we, I was, not very interested in Good King Wenceslas and other things. Yeah. I was playing one play hillbilly music. Yeah. But uh, they introduced us <laughs> to, like the Barkers, who had teas and, you know, were very... Uh, yeah, class was an interesting thing in this neighborhood, looking back. We were very conscious of it, but we didn't... It, it didn't affect us growing I mean, we up. We all but had our place in that. Well, and the, the you know, it was pretty. It was a mixed neighborhood, but we were very conscious of class. The Boyds, for example, we knew he was a very erudite person. He was an inventor, after all. They had these two gorgeous cars, these old Packards and Russian Wolfhounds. We didn't like. We didn't know what. A, never seen a Wolfhound. The um, uh, the El I just want to mention that Mr. Ellsworth, who was the son of a Russian Jew, um, loved my mom. 
they got along famously. He thought my mom, all of her stories from the South and all, they, she thought she would, they, they, they really hit it off. He was a chain smoker too. He used to drive up this, this Come home place for lunch. so fast. Oh my God. And turn that corner. Turn that corner on two wheels. Traffic on, up and down this hill has been a problem ever since we lived out here. But he was the worst speeder. He was like a. And uh, I'll never forget him playing the violin with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And he was married to calm, calm lady. Who oh, yeah, she was calm. Nothing ever ruffled it? Nancy. But I, I and also. She drove him crazy. Oh, he was very emotional. He used to say that she was a great player. She was second violin in the, is it the National Gallery? The they they used to be on TV yeah. with the National yeah, well, Gallery. She was second, uh, he was first. Program. So he was concert master, as they call it. Um, but he always said that she played robotically. And in fact, she still plays today. And she can remember anything without looking at music and play it. But he, he was a very passionate man. That's the only criticism he had. He played with great... Passion. I probably couldn't have told the difference between the two. They told the story at his funeral. One of the men from the symphony orchestra, and he said that they wanted, for some reason, they wanted to have a party or do something and have gypsy music. And they asked him if he could, you know, tell them anybody. And he says, "Why, well, yes, I can do that." Yeah, and yeah, so, he could play all that music. He loved Brahms, all of the Hungarian. <laughs> Folk songs that Brahms used for his uh, for some of those gypsy songs that he orchestrated, he knew all those. But I I think one of the things looking back, um, this our generation was in a little bubble really. It was wonderful growing up, but there were you, you had glimmerings of things that weren't that that of a of a another way of thinking or looking at the whole 50s experience. I remember when the Rosenbergs were executed, for example. I'll never forget looking at that headline, like, what is this? Ex the H-bomb secrets and all. A lot of the stuff of the Cold War did not penetrate our mentality out here. Um, there were people working for the government. We never, nobody ever talked about the Cold War, anything, um, or even the Korean War. Uh, it was it was like we were growing up in some kind of a bubble, and and that bubble really didn't crack until um, probably JFK was assassinated. That was like a huge dividing line between the fifties and the sixties. The sixties began when Kennedy was assassinated in sixty three, but looking back, I I find, think that the fifties just mentally was a pre totally oppressive. I mean, it was the sixties that really imprinted me, but. Uh, you know, the people, our parents were people who went through the Second World War, they went through the Depression. They weren't interested, they had come through a, a, a turbulent period when, you know, labor unrest, uh, co economy collapsing, war, and they were just happy, you know, hey, we're stable, we're, everything's getting better, and the kids, we were all part of that bubble, but... Uh, Music, we had a happy, we had a happy yeah. childhood. But we were living under the music. threat of the A bomb and uh, and the commune, and we accepted all that you know Cold War stuff. I remember one of the we watched. I led three lives about this guy who was like a who was a you know communists were everywhere. McCarthy, remember? I remember the McCarthy stuff. I just like okay. <laughs> uh, segre we lived in an apartheid society. It was as apartheid as South Africa ever was in recent times, and just totally accepted. I mean. So there's no real, uh, our consciousness wasn't really raised. That's the extreme it didn't do much difference. for our consciousness, but yeah. as they say, ignorance is bliss. And uh, that's what it was like. It was a very blissfully we ignorant. We were very insulated, very insulated in a way. By our, because they never to white fought. most of the Cold they War, all of this. Our country, on our, and we weren't threatened with. Uh, I can remember as a little child, when you'd go to the movies, you would see the. Uh, shorts about the war and the bombings and and I would hear the bombs go down and make that noise and I can remember when I was a little kid you know there at first a time when I could lay at night and if you heard a plane go over or something I would listen to see if if there was going to be a bomb coming down so there was I, I remember that part of the newscast that came on they would when you would go to the movies as a kid. There would be. This a, is World War Two. World War Two. Oh. Yeah. 
I don't remember that. Because I, I hadn't thought about that in years, but I can remember laying in bed and hearing the... You see, the Korean War wasn't covered that way. You didn't have all yeah. this, like, the Vietnam War was, World War II was to some extent, although they didn't show the kind of atrocities and stuff you would have seen in the 60s from Vietnam. But the Korean War was covered with just a map and very few, yeah. very little black and white photography on TV. So, and we had some people, men from the Korean War that came back and went to school when yeah, they were the going along to finish their high school, evidently. But it was, uh, looking back, boy, were we insulated. And it was, uh, I guess that's good, you know, if you're a kid growing up. But, uh, I, and race was a huge issue. It was more immediate. Our parents were both uh, uh, very conscious of race, to put it in a genteel way. My mom more than my dad, but... Um, dad less, because when he had been... He worked with one, black people. When he uh, got a job working at one of the stores in town in Texas, and one of the things he did, he delivered groceries to their ha house. Some of the families, some people he knew, you know, in that town. Uh, I know that when he we went back to visit, he always made a point of seeing some of the ones that he had uh, Yeah, Dad grew up picking cotton with. in the fields with black people. And I remember when I was used to go on the bus with him, uh, uh, all those maids that were going downtown, they, all, they seemed to love Dad. He was talking to them all the he time. Knew he, was, about, he knew when they had Juneteenth or, or the, some of the, all the various holidays that they have in the South, mm -hmm. Emancipation Day and different ones. And he talked to them. And, and one of the black drivers said one time, said, you know, your father was one of the ones that trained me when I went to work for Capital Transit or something. And yeah, so a lot of the white drivers, when the black, and, uh, blacks were admitted to the Union in the 60s, yeah. as my dad was about to retire, they wouldn't, they wouldn't work with... So with uh, he was so that was nice demeaning to their status as, yeah. as drivers. You know, being a driver was a big deal back then, and a black man being a driver, I guess, demeaned your your yeah. your career and your your work in their eyes. And he wouldn't train them, but Dad did. My mom was was uh, who had never grown up around black people really. I saw rather was much more very very race conscious. <laughs> I, I was I mean she was a racist. There's no doubt about it. Uh, my dad was at best conflicted. But and, but the point I want to make is that that, um, you know, that was something that was, again, going back to just being unaware of it, we just like, oh, the black people all live in Kingar. That was, it was maybe more apparent in the South when we went to East Texas, because you, uh, there were all these unwritten rules there that you had to obey because black and white people intermix more. There. And they had grown up the families in East of Texas, that was the South, the deep South, really. But up here, it was, there was more apartheid, although in D.C., Less so, but we weren't as affected by well, it. Well, it was, was interesting to go back and see, but because these were, it, there weren't people moving in and out. These were families of black people that had worked for other families for generations. Yeah, it's wholly different in the South. And the whole racial on thing one of our mother's step grandmother, she had a, a black lady that lived with her like a sister they were raised together her father gave her to granny when she was a girl and they lived together until her black sister went to church with her and everything and when she retired she got a house before anybody ate on christmas day or anything she did that's mother's Uncle. Yeah, it was totally, uh, totally different. Had to, so. He had to get the horse and take take food and dinner and presents to this maid. Yeah, they, uh, there's a lot before more. anybody else had theirs. That was, there's all that personal interaction. And it, the, the it problem, was sort of interesting. To the see. thing about the South was that everybody knew the rules. I mean, it was like, if, okay, this is the way it was, but as long as you don't want to vote. I mean, if you wanted to vote, that's a different matter. If you wanted to, you know, Nobody pro. Every black people were really acculturated to to their place. Place was a big thing, but I think up here. But 
and you really had to know the and rules because you're around black up. people. Up here, there was nobody saw any. I never saw any blacks. They were all in Kengar. I don't know yeah. where they. And they went into the district to work, or people in the district yeah. came out as maids. I remember that on the buses. I don't remember if. Uh, I think you didn't have to sit in the back of the bus then. I don't remember, but maybe they did early on. Never noticed it, it. I, it was interesting to find out when DC Transit was desegregated. It may have been after Dad started working, I'm sure, in 35, at some point. But, but, but I don't, you know, we were just, uh, again, just blissfully ignorant, and our parents didn't, uh, you know, they, they were so tired from depression and struggle. They didn't, they were just, they didn't want to talk about anything. <laughs> that was my only complaint against the 50s looking back, but at the time I didn't have any complaints at all. Well, I, the 50s I, I, went I to was 60s, glad I wouldn't have yeah. known until the 60s. <laughs> I thought the 50s were, that's when I Well, they were, yeah. they were, but looking back, uh, they're, they're, uh, the, it was built on um, Cold War mentality, um, apartheid, um, you know, all these things, I mean, that, that that I was much more conscious of in the 60s. Um, I, I didn't think about any of the stuff till Kennedy was assassinated. Then I got obsessed with, the, you know, the whole assassination, conspiracy theories and all that, but... How did, but, the, Beatles, but, how did the Beatles affect you? I'm sorry? The Beatles. Well, that's sixties. Um, I think it. I remember when they. Were I think it affected everybody. And they were putting the. In ads. fact, the Be in fact, I was when Kennedy was shot. I was uh, I was listening to the first Beatles album. I hadn't. The Beatles were just coming to the states or had been to the states. They didn't affect me at all. This was sixty three when they first hit, but I wasn't interested in them because I was interested in Elvis and all that stuff, and they just. I, I didn't like their look or something. It didn't seem like they were. They had a hard edge to them. Later, I'd get more interested in the Rolling Stones, I think, than the Beatles. But very quickly, they caught on. By 64, everybody was a Beatles fan. I had, of course, my ninth grade art classes and everything. All the little girls wanted to go see the Beatles. And they'd had, in, for weeks in the newspaper, the Beatles are coming, the Beatles are coming. I don't know if you saw those. And I thought, what in the heck? I thought it had something to do with Volkswagen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it was a big deal. And it's like when the twist came out. First time I saw that, I was teaching then and went in after lunch. And See, it affected kids. people a little bit down the age so, scale. But more, uh, more impacted them these more kids had, some of them had tickets to go see the Beatles when they performed. And they came back saying, it was so loud, everybody was standing up. We could see, we couldn't hear. <laughs> yeah. and we wanted to see what was going on, and said so people were jumping up and down and doing things, and they were, they were, they. It wasn't a good experience for the, for the but, Bethesda but the, crowd. But the continuity across what was becoming a generational divide yeah. in music, not that people our age didn't get on board with the Beatles and, and later rock and roll, but it was a little, you know, there was a little bit of a pause or, a, 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 you know. Uh, a lack of understanding or interest immediately, but uh, one of the continuities was the Ed Sullivan show, because um, uh, I don't know how they heard about the Beatles. Probably in the news media, newspapers, oh, things yeah, like that, because you wouldn't have heard it on TV. But the Beatles really made it big when they hit Ed Sullivan. But then Elvis had also made it big, I think, at Ed Sullivan or Milton Berle. So these kind of entertainment shows were. That was, they unified these two, the, the, the first and, and next generation of rock and roll. Uh, uh, and that's when people who were a little bit older than your ninth graders, like us, would have first seen the Beatles, would have been on else. So everybody watched Ed Sullivan. And everybody watched the Beatles when they first appeared in their second appearance. The same way we watched Elvis. I remember watching Elvis on Ed Sullivan. From the waist up. That was so funny. I look at what's on TV now, and I think about the big deal they made about him kind yeah. of shaking around. No, it's you can't even. The stuff that's uh, spoken about today, and and the visual, uh, you know, thing, you know, uh, 
Well, she mentioned the Vargas poster. I think what you can see on your internet today compared to a Vargas poster, which was actually a work of art yeah. that uh, like somebody the had. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the calendars with with uh, bikini girls on. That was like a huge thing. But that comes out of the 30s and the 40s too. That wasn't the Daisy Betty Grable, <laughs> you know, photograph. Um, but but uh, what we had in terms of uh, uh, sex, violence, you. Um, on, you know, visually express, uh, you know, in the movies, well, there's nothing, there's just no comparison whatsoever. We are very naive, all the, I mean, growing up, very naive, you didn't know what was going on in the world, much less. Uh, and if we knew Calvin Lemon's father was, was, was punishing them by, by hitting the ends of their finger with a hammer, it was like, the, you know, the pastor was always there to pop up and say to him, well, that's none of your business. See, <laughs> so, I didn't know that The gold was wasn't older. our business. Yeah. All the stuff was happy. The world was in our business. You know, it was it was a blissfully ignorant time. Now, I mean, I agree with you. It was wonderful growing up, and I, it was only in retrospect that I you know can look back. But then I became a historian in the '60s, so I was just a a typical kid growing up in the '40s and '50s. Here, it was. A... Well, that's great. I, I think uh, we've got an hour and a half. I think and that's probably. Yeah, that's probably. I think yeah. that's, a, that's a good spot. I'm going to go ahead and hit pause here. Okay, yeah.